Around the world today, more and more people are being pushed deeper into humanitarian crisis due to new and ongoing conflicts and consequences of various issues, including climate and ecological emergency. Now, if those in need of humanitarian assistance from the country, believe me, it will probably be the third largest in the world. And this suffering non-country is growing at an exponential rate of about 30% since 2022. Now, more than ever before, people in crisis are in need of humanitarian support. The federal government of Nigeria, for instance, on Friday, announced that as of June 2023, a total of 3.6 million people were displaced in the northeast, northwest, and north central regions of Nigeria. We could go on and on with uh, several other data from the UNHCR and, and the rest of them. But, you know, the current year has also witnessed the kidnapping of five aid workers in the Northeast alongside similar incidents from various corners of our nation. Not very pleasant to hear, but that's our reality. Let's have a conversation around World Humanitarian Day 2023. And the theme is It Takes a Village. Two gentlemen join us this morning. Olu Shola Tejosho is Communication Coordinator for Lagos. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. Good morning and thank you for having me. And we also have Emmanuel Osemeka, who is Country Director, Social Welfare Network Initiative in our Abuja studio. Thank you for joining us today. Good morning and thank yeah. you for having me. So do we say, uh, Mr. Tejosho, do we say Happy World Humanitarian Day? <laughs> Day, so yeah, but I'm you know, glad. while we are celebrating or marking the day, the issues aren't funny. The, the data is staggering. UNHCR that I cited, for instance, their operating data says a staggering 3,578,966 internally displaced persons were recorded as of June this year in the northeast, northwest, and north central regions of the country. What that means is that families, venerable and resilient, find themselves navigating dire consequences. Well, it's not the same thing in Lagos, but it's not to say that Lagos is having it any less, right? Uh, well, so interesting, but unfortunately that is the reality. And uh, we must just continue to do the very best we can to ensure that uh, we navigate ourselves out of this uh, mm. challenge. But for Lagos, based on your question, yes, Lagos is not really experiencing such, but it doesn't mean that uh, we are not having displaced people in Lagos as well. Because generally, when we talk about people being displaced, it majorly comes from two angles, conflict-driven displacement, that is what you are having uh, in the northeastern part of Nigeria and also the north central, as well as northwest, like you said, based on your data. The other angle to it is two natural disasters, mm. like flood, like fire, and other things. These are issues that can also trigger displacement that will cause people to be away from their, from their abode. Uh, for Lagos, like you also know, last year we had some issue of flood, which also affected some people. But like uh, we all know that uh, to an extent, Lagos has capacity to respond to, to emergency. And at the moment, I think there are about two resettlement centers put together by Lagos State Government with Lasema, one at Segundo and one at Ekorodu. So whenever we have such issues, these are places where they take people to for them to be able to at least pull their head for some time before they can be able to look for a way to reunite themselves back to, to their family. So, but it's not so much, but we have a level, a level of displacement as well, also well, in Lagos. So let, me, let, me, let me put this to you, and this is just an instance, uh, before I go to Mr. Simeka in Abuja studio. The, help people understand, you know, what things, you know, if it's not war, it is something else. Getting people to leave certain localities is usually a problem. Uh, how do you handle that? I give the example, for instance, of the uh, refuse dump um, at Olushosun. Mm -hmm. You know, there are people living so closely to the place. And so, it naturally, it raises the question in my own mind, look, how are people dealing with that? So, in terms of such situations, 
How do you get people to move away from places that are not safe for them in the name of humanitarian aid? Well, uh, it's, it's, it's dicey, and, uh, but that is the reality. Uh, people decide to, to stay back in their ancestral community for diverse reasons. Apart from Olushoson, even in some interior part of the country, we've seen a lot, a whole lot. We have cases whereby a whole community will be flooded, people have no place to sleep, and yet they are not even ready to leave the place. They will tell you, and my father was buried there, my grandfather was buried there, I cannot live here. So it, it boils down to, to orientation and to, to mindset. Mm. So and it, it's always very difficult. But for us, as humanitarian aid worker, it, it, we can't force people to, to leave. But the best we can do is to go to communities and build their resilience. Mm. Okay. And that's part of what we do as Red Cross. We go to communities, build their resilience, and improve their capacity on how they can be able to respond to issues, to disaster, and how they can be able to mitigate such occurrences. Okay. Mr. Sebeka, um, this whole idea of humanitarian day, World Humanitarian Day, started um, far enough, far back enough, when the, uh, the, the, due to that bombing in Iraq, uh, which we all know about. But you know, since 2016, the Aid Workers Security Database had recorded the tragic loss of 37 and 37 aid workers and 24 wounded, 34 kidnapped in the northeast of Nigeria alone. Uh, I'm almost certain that this is not just peculiar to, to the northeast. We'll have pockets of areas like that where such, where aid workers, one can say they are an endangered species. How would you say we are working to either protect them or even offer them the correct intervention per time. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Um, um, I, um, so basically, the reality is that the humanitarian aid worker is not immune, you know, from the, you know, the insecurity itself. As much as humanitarian aid is, you know, geared towards assisting people and making sure that you reduce their level of suffering as a result of um, conflict-induced or natural disaster, just like my my friend, you know, from Nigerian Red Cross, you know, clearly enumerated, you know, with you in Abuja in Lagos Studios. The re the, the truth is, um, humanitarian workers are also come, you know, across. Uh, to the aggressors, if you use the, a case in point, um, for example, the Boko Haram activities in the Northeast, um, we've had our own fair share of um, experience, you know, with regards to being victims ourselves. Um, we lost one of our drivers, he was kidnapped by the Boko Haram um, three years ago. Um, of course, with our vehicle, and uh, till today we we've not found him, and so that's one direct hit on us. Um, we've um, come across several, you know, um, ambushes, um, bomb blasts left and right, but so we've just escaped by the grace of God, um, you know, by the mercies of God, and of course by. The, the, the expertise of our military who have always come to our aid, you know, when such come, you know, happens. So the reality is that the humanitarian aid workers who risk their lives to venture into trouble zones or difficult terrains to provide the much needed food assistance or provide water or provide um, any protection related activities for conflict-related or victims of insurgency or victims of natural disasters also come, you know, they also expose themselves to the vagaries of the risks there. Um, so the aid workers are not immune. They are part and parcel of the situation and the challenges that goes with it. So that's why you today say, yeah. is set aside to celebrate. Mm. Mm. So. 
you would say then that providing humanitarian services in Nigeria is not even safe for those who want to rescue others from lack of safety. Well, the reality is that it's not any, nobody is safe. I mean, whether you're providing um, humanitarian aid in Afghanistan or Libya or Syria or Ukraine or Nigeria, anywhere you are as a humanitarian aid worker, you are equally exposed to the vagaries of that environment or that situation. Um, the difference is that there are safety measures, there are rules of engagement which you must adhere to. But sometimes, I mean, you, you obey the rules, but um, the reality is that if you are in a conflict environment and there are people you need to support, as even if um, you are operating within a certified camp environment, it does not preclude you know, the non-state actors from invading that locality. We've had several of that, you know, in Syria, in Afghanistan, as much as, you know, we've also had that in Goza, in Limankara, in Madagali, in Ngoshe, Pulka. We, you have that all, all across. So, um, or even talk about in Benue states or in Plateau states. You, so the, the, the reality is that the non-state actors have no limits to where and how and when they will strike. Uh, the, our prayer and our you know, desire is that most often there are preparations that are made and of course the military or security forces create some form of buffer, but sometimes those buffers are broken down and if you have a battalion to protect a particular camp and you have more than 1,000 aggressors coming, I do not see how and how easy it will be for just this single battalion to wade off that attack. So that's what is exactly we're talking about. So that's why you see that sometimes um, aid workers are kidnapped and sometimes aid workers are kidnapped on transit, you know, because you move from one locality to the other. Sometimes you go through very difficult terrain and in going through those difficult terrain, you are also exposed to all kinds of things. So there are, whether you are in an um, um, armored vehicle or you are uh, not in an armored vehicle, there are bombs or IEDs planted on the road which can explode and kill or explode and create some sort of um, a blockade. And of course, by that, the idea would be for them to block, then take, you know, come out from their hiding and, you know, attack and carry as many people as possible for ransom. Yeah. Hmm. Very interesting um, situations right there. I don't, I don't even know how to go about this. But wait, let me ask you, Mr. Tejusho. So, data from the UN indicates, for instance, that about 25 million people are facing hunger crisis. Uh, given the insecurity, climate change, and flood. So what is the, the Red Cross doing or plans to do to ameliorate uh, the situation? Okay, well, um, that's a, the data we see from, a, from them, from the United Nations. But as it is, uh, Red Cross is, uh, you know, we are auxiliary to government, and based on this uh, role as empowered by the act of Red Cross 1960. We, we are doing the best we can to ensure that uh, we alleviate the suffering of the most vulnerable. But just as you know that basically Red Cross will depend on donors fund, we depend on donation from spirited individuals, from corporate organizations, and from general public to be able to carry out our core mandate. So for us, we have a plan, we already have our, our operation in place in order for us to be able to look at how we can be able to do the very best we can to reduce this uh, figure and ensure that uh, we, we give hope to these vulnerable people. Mm -hmm. So, and this is another privilege for us to also call on individuals to assist and uh, look at how they can be able to be part of what Cross is doing because mm -hmm. the work is enormous. And the government alone cannot really do it. And so for you, us as Red Cross, we are depending on donors from individuals to also be able so to. So you consider, support. you know, funding a significant uh, issue? Yes, funding. Yeah, funding is key to our operation. Mm. It's key to this in, 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 yes, in the sense that uh, 
One, we have a manpower, like you know, our membership is local based. We have a member spread across the 774 local government of Nigeria, you know, the 30 state of the Federation and FCT. So to carry out some of these activities of us, we need funding, we need to be able to carry out aid assistance, medical assistance, and also be able to navigate through the security concerns, logistical uh, complexities and the likes. So fund is a key, it's, a, it's very, very key, and it's partnership with uh, donors and also be able to look at how our movement partners can also support us as well. Well, Mr. Semeka, do you consider funding as significant as well? Uh, given the issues that you have raised? Humanitarian response is a very, very expensive venture. Um, so you take a look at the, you take a cursory look at the humanitarian activities across the globe. Um, sometime in 2018, Nigeria had a, um, a humanitarian response, national humanitarian response call for about $2.2 billion. And at the time, we were dealing with almost 6 point something million displaced people, both directly and indirectly. Uh, that number has reduced significantly as a result of the successes recorded by um, our military in the Northeast, for example. But of course, um, um, a lot of these activities, a lot of the displacements have shifted to the, some of the states in the north central region and of course you know further down uh, but today we have a call for about uh, one point i think 1.2 billion or 1.6 billion dollars but so far this is august the funds raised so far for the nigerian humanitarian response is in the neighborhood of about 400 million which is a far cry from where you know the journey what is the reason the reason is because there are so many humanitarian activities going on across the globe. So one in, in case in point is the issue of the Ukraine and Russia um, war. You have issues in Afghanistan, you have issues in Syria, you have issues in Turkey. You currently you have fire going on, fire, you know, wildfire in Canada, which is affecting America as well. And they are all, you know, focusing most of their funding you know, in taking care of themselves and of course, but of course, the major concern for the world fund, fund, you know, funders, who are also funders of the Nigerian humanitarian response, major funders of the Nigerian humanitarian uh, response, is uh, focus on Ukraine. Uh, because I mean, who are the funders? You're talking about US, UK, France, uh, New Zealand, China, um, and of course, a lot of these Scandinavian countries, they bring their funding here and there. The biggest funders are the US and the UK through the USAID, International Red Cross and Red Crescent Society, which is the biggest humanitarian organization in the world. It, is, it has always been my belief as a player, as a national player, that Nigeria would have copied the structure of the US or at least the UK, because that is where we you know, take a lot of our um, our style, our strategies from. In the US, you have the Federal Emergency Management Agency that is squarely focused on disaster management. Disaster management and not displacement management. Mm -hmm. While the International Red Cross and Red Christian Society and of course if, uh, a lot of other humanitarian organizations are focused in displacement managing, management when necessary and they provide those kinds of aids. Uh, so the first responder is basically FEMA. But in Nigeria, we have the National Emergency Management Agency that is, was created specifically for disaster management, just like FEMA in America. But unfortunately, for political reasons or what have you, we have also pushed our NEMA to begin to handle humanitarian response and the displacement management, which they were not cut out to in the first place. And of course, you now have, in addition, the um, High Commission for Refugees and Migrants, and of course included IDPs as well. Then in addition to that, we've created the Ministry of Humanitarian Response. All of this, when you take a look at their overhead costs, I've just mentioned three, but there are several others. If you take a look at their overhead cost, it's humongous. And it's a, I mean, if you take a chunk of that, you'll be able to provide some level of support and of course assistance to displaced people or support disaster activities in one way or the other. 
So for me, duplication of activities is one of the major challenges we are having, and those funders can go to better use. So for example, we have the Nigerian Red Cross, which can be a similitude of the International Red Cross and um, Red Crescent Society, or we can create our own similitude of USAID. Not exactly that, but my, this, my understanding is that private sector-driven humanitarian response or displacement management or goes well for the society, saves you cost, then the government can sit back and do what you call monitoring and evaluation okay. and punish people where they are. But the reverse is the case where the government agency is the one responsible for the responses. So the question I and a few others ask is, when the government fails or misappropriates or mismanages, who punishes the government? That's a, that's a, a million, that's a million dollar question answer. right there, uh, Mr. Simica. But you know, a quick one that I want to ask you, you know, is, I mean, talking about, you know, your national spread and all, how up front and center would you say governments, federal, state, or local, put humanitarian issues on their to-do list? Okay, so, um, the simple question, answer to that is, is that the government across level from federal, state, and, and local government, of course, for me, the local government appears not to be existing, is that they look at the humanitarian response as a political tool. So they respond to it using their various photo ops and all that. So for example, you see a governor who has myriads of issues and myriads of challenges, wake up in the morning or may take out three or four, may take out a week, and is busy going around distributing rice, beans, and oil to communities. If it is not for political experience, why would the governor do that when the local government is available? Hmm. Besides even the local government, there are several other NGOs or, or organizations that you can use. Because why I emphasize the NGOs is that the NGOs are there to support government. But the government in Nigeria have sort of taken over that responsibility from the NGOs and making it very difficult for the NGOs to, you know, um, respond appropriately. And I believe that, just like the point I made earlier, we have seasoned, you know, organizations, philanthropic and grant-making organizations in Nigeria. One of them is the Two-Head and Juma Foundation, that for over 10 years have provided funding and capacity development to Nigerian organizations and made grants to them to support in the areas of health, education, humanitarian response, including the IDP's activities. And this is an organization that has serious accountability framework that when the government channels all the funds through them, they can now monitor and ask them questions where necessary, if they misappropriate or if they do wrong. But today, the government is sees humanitarian response as a political tool, and they use it for vote, by, for vote um, mobilization and what have you. So the, the reality is until we begin to see humanitarian response as pure assistance to ameliorate and reduce the sufferings of victims of either conflict-affected areas or natural disaster-prone regions we are still playing. Mm. The five trailer loads of um, rice sent to East State, I am still wondering how they are going to distribute it. Because, well, for example, my organization in the past how many years have been attending to taking care of 174,000 households in four local governments in the Northeast. And on a monthly basis, we do on the average of 50 or 60 trucks. Mm. And it's still not enough. Yet, you are doing five trucks to a state is still very laughable to me, and we're watching with keen interest. Well, again, as you, as you said, we're watching. But let me ask you, uh, Mr. Tejosho. Now, this year's theme of the world, for the World Humanitarian Day is no matter what. And I also know that the United Nations SDG goals, the theme is leave no one behind. Mm -hmm. Are they in any way connected to you? Uh, yes, yes. They are, they are connected. Okay. One, okay, for the team of uh, this year, International Humanitarian Day, no matter what, no matter the challenges, no matter the threats, no matter the difficulties, we will continue to 
provide our internal service. Mm. Then, in line with one of the goals of a SDG, that is leave no one behind. Mm. So, based on what I just analyzed, no matter what, no matter the challenges, no matter the threat, no matter the difficulty, we will leave no one behind. Mm. We will okay. ensure that everybody is carried along and every vulnerable people are attended to. Okay. Let's use the example of Lagos. I mean, he spoke to it the other time. Uh, you know, what state governments do? What's been the response for you from the, especially the local governments? There are 20 officially in uh, you Lagos. Know, Lagos and 37 LCDAs. How, what's been the relationship? How's it been for you navigating? In spite of the challenges, as you put it, what if you maybe you want to cite? You may want to cite an example of a peculiar uh, uh, situation, humanitarian situation in Lagos, and how the difficulty you're encountering and how you are able to navigate. Okay, well, for us, you know, like I said earlier on, the humanitarian service is like a tripod: conflict-driven displacement, health emergencies, and natural disasters. But for us in Lagos, what we've been having majorly is the area of health emergencies. And that's where we've been, for Nigeria Air Cross, another part of Nigeria, yes, we've been involved in other activities. But for us in Lagos, because of the peculiarity of Lagos, we've been actively involved in the health emergencies. And that's the reason why we've been actively involved in the issue of uh, RI, with immunization for diphtheria, for muses. When COVID came, the same thing. When Ebola came, the same thing. So like I said earlier on, to answer your question, we have Red Cross across all the 20 local governments. We call it division for us in Red Cross. And in order for us to be able to implement all these operations, our divisional secretaries at those level, those local governments, work directly with the MOH at those local governments. We just finished our intervention on diphtheria about two weeks ago in nine local governments, and it was a fantastic relationship. Mm -hmm. So on LT-related issue, we work directly with the MOH at the local level, also with the health educators at the local level. And this is based on our relationship with the state primary health care board of Lagos State. So as far as relationship is concerned, it's very good, and they've always been very, very cooperative, because they've been seeing us as partners. And that is exactly what we've been doing over the time. So it's been very, very good, and though it can be better, but so far, so good. They've been very, very cooperative and supportive. Mr. Semeka, let's close with this question. So the ministers are going to uh, get into the saddle from Monday, uh, particularly the um, humanitarian services and humanitarian deliverables of Nigeria that you spoke to. Do you see any hope in sight, any specific agenda you want to give to the minister as he comes in? Well, um... The, the needs are um, quite humongous, honestly. Um, the minister designate for the humanitarian affairs has her background in health, primary health care. So one way or the other, I believe she's going to have a lot of input and a lot of understanding, you know, and most probably I believe she will be able to push for... Um, improvement in the health services because in the last eight years um, the government sort of dropped the ball a little bit and that's why like you mentioned in your last conversation with the DG of this um, uh, Center for Disease Control um, we, we were what do you call it we were polio free but we're back on the saddle again with immunization you know dropped significantly um, the, all kinds of stuff has happened uh, which we will not have the time to explain. But most importantly today, which I believe that the humanitarian minister should look at, we do not want to see a situation where cash distribution happens without accountability. Mm -hmm. It is very important that every response comes with serious and, you know, verifiable measures for accountability. It must be impact driven. Okay. It must you know, embody the seven principles of humanitarian response. Okay. One is humani humanity, neutrality, independence, unity, and versati versatility. It's important that those principles are embedded in every response, be it from government, or from the private 
organization. Okay, then. So for it's us, a, I, yeah. I want to push that since she in, in Calabar was able to work with civil societies properly, she should be able to bring on the table or to the table humanitarian NGOs to prick their capacity okay. for better and improved service delivery to the people. Well, thank you so much, uh, Mr. Osemeka, for, for that one. And we can only wait and hope that, you know, all of these aspirations are met and we have a more humane nation. Emmanuel Osemeka, Country Director, Social Welfare Network Initiative, thank you so much for your time this morning, as well as Olushola Tejo Sho, who is Communication Coordinator for Lagos. Thank you again for your time this morning. Welcome. Now, another concerning conversation is going to happen when we return from this break. Please stay with us. <laughs>